This is Jadecast, your gateway to traditional martial arts and Chinese culture. Brought to you by your host, Shuffle Jonathan Bluestein. Shoes! What are the best shoes for martial arts practice? No doubt this is a question that every single martial artist on the planet has asked themselves at one point or another. And the answer is complex and might surprise you in certain aspects. So shoes are wonderful and they also have issues. Bare feet are wonderful and they also have issues. Let's look at the pros and cons of various types of shoes as well as training bare feet and see if we could arrive at a conclusion of really what's best for us as martial artists. Uh, also, uh, what's most fitting for different styles. Let me begin by saying that I have experiment, experimented with this a lot. I have trained with uh, all manner of shoes. And I've also trained mostly barefoot for many years and I've even walked barefoot 95% of the time everywhere, including on the street, for about three years. Uh, at that period of time, uh, I would walk barefoot uh, from my house to the grocery store, to, um, to the mail, to the park, essentially everywhere unless I was uh, going to a restaurant or going out on a date when I was single many years ago or if I were going to to celebrate a festivity then I might wear shoes but otherwise I walked barefoot for for years it was wonderful it also had many issues and I'll get to that so shoes um, there are many shoes that are beneficial for us some shoes are just a big no-no for instance think about hiking shoes and hiking boots. Now, they're wonderful looking at times, but there tends to be an inverse relationship between how beautiful a shoe is and how suitable it is for martial arts training. It's not always true, but it's usually true. So the problem with hiking shoes and hiking boots, first of all, they grip your foot too tight. Now you'd be inclined to think, oh, how is that a problem? because I want a strong grip on my foot to keep it stable. Mm hmm. Well, too much of anything is, is just excessive, you know, and it can cause problems. And the issue this causes with hiking shoes and hiking boots is that your shoe becomes like a cast and you don't want a cast on your foot. It's too stiff in many ways. And then you become more prone to sprain your ankle. An ankle sprain, when it's mild, it's just painful and you get over it in a few days. But if you get a serious ankle sprain, that's a repeating injury that you're going to have issues with for 10 years, 20 years, possibly for life. Uh, that's not a risk you would like to take in training. So that's one problem. And this results from, again, those uh, hiking shoes and boots being very tight on in the manner in which they grip your foot and then their edges are stiff and when you incline your foot at an angle especially a 30 35 40 45 degree angle it's very easy to sprain the foot sideways and become injured and I bet that if you've been wearing hiking shoes and boots for many years like I have as a child as an, and as a teen then you had at least once experienced this and it's nasty it's not at all a nice thing to have all right so another problem is that the soles of those shoes that i just mentioned are quite stiff which is not good for us they do not absorb the shock that comes off the ground well and goes directly to our spine and moreover that because they need a very good grip because they're for hiking they have all of those little protrusions at the bottom and they make the sole very uneven 
which basically uh, on a flat ground, flat surface, which we encounter in, in a home, in a martial arts school, or on most streets, uh, that would make us more unstable, which is not something we would like to have in the martial arts. And there's also an issue with the toes that I would get to, but essentially, because of all of these problems and others, uh, hiking shoes and boots are not suitable for the martial arts. Now granted, they're suitable at times for various things. Uh, if I had to go into combat, then whether the opponent be carrying knives or maybe the battlefield is full of sharp objects, possibly you would like thick, heavy boots. Also, if you're going to kick someone and you're going to kick them hard, then uh, it is likely that those boots would do a lot of damage. Uh, some of them even have those steel plates at the front. Uh, so, I mean, they have the, their uses, but if we're looking at long-term training and health, this is not the best choice, to say the least. Now, what we also have are dress shoes, uh, which are easy to rule out. They're just unstable and they're uh, inconvenient for our toes oftentimes. Uh, they're built in awkward ways, but they look great. They look great. Maybe once or once a year or every two years, I, I might wear dress shoes for uh, some festivity. That's a lovely thing. I mean, clothes are a blessing and they're part of our human culture. We shouldn't rule something out just because it's not perfect for a certain activity. But I'm just saying, dress shoes are not something you'd like to wear on an everyday basis or for martial arts training. And here I want to get into... Uh, a different type of problem that's shared by the hiking boots and shoes, by the dress shoes, and also by most of the sports shoes that we have nowadays. So all of those types of shoes, the issue with them is that they tend to have stiff heels, which are moreover uh, slightly higher, elevated, relative to the front part of the shoe. When you have elevated heels that has several issues that come along with it. So, first of all, when you have an elevated heel, it causes your hamstrings and your gastrocnemius muscles to shorten over time. This is something that's not going to happen over a few days or two weeks. It takes years and decades to, to really take a strong effect. But once this effect has reshaped your muscles in a certain way, then you're going to have a big problem going back to how your muscles are, ought to be uh, structured and functional naturally. So here's the deal. If you think about how you stretch the gastrocnemius, which are the uh, bulby muscles at the back of your shin, the equivalent of the thick forearm and the thick muscles in the inside of the forearm just on the back of the shin these are the gastrocnemius and the hamstrings which are at the back of your thigh if you would like to stretch them one of the best ways to stretch them is to uh, sit down and reach to your toes or reach past your toes which we could also think of when you stand up and you re and you bend over and you reach with your palms to the floor now, this action stretches this whole kinetic chain uh, that also includes the gastrocnemius muscles at the back of the shin and the hamstrings at the back of the thighs. Now, imagine what would happen if you stand up and you bend over and you try to touch the floor. If you want to make it easier, what do you do? You lift your heels because this, this makes the stretch easier because it unstretches the, ham the hamstrings and the gastrocnemius and this is what often happens to people when they try to make, make this type of stretch and they're very inflexible so essentially when you think of the heels imagine yourself standing barefoot on the floor reaching with your hands to the floor in front of you now imagine that instead of barefoot you have heels maybe high heels when is it going to be more difficult to touch the floor? When you have the, the heels or when you're barefoot? Actually, the heels help you. They kind of topple you over when you bend over. And 
they make it easier for you to reach the ground when you lift the heels. So they basically unstretch the gastrocnemius and the hamstring muscles. Now realize that when you wear any types of shoes that have elevated heels, any type of shoe in which the sole is not completely flat or almost flat, then your gastrocnemius, your heel is elevated at all times. And the gastrocnemius and the hamstring, hamstring muscles are de-stretched at all times as long as you're standing and you're wearing those shoes with elevated heels. Now this is a problem shared by most types of shoes. So this is problem number one with sports shoes that they also share with other types of shoes. The other problem is that when we have elevated heels, what happens is that we tend to walk and strike very hard with the heel onto the ground instead of walking lightly and gently or lightlier and gentlier as you would walk if you were barefoot, comparatively speaking, depending on the individual. Now, you can try this experiment right now. You can stand up. You have to stand up to really feel it. Stand up and uh, you can be barefoot, which is best, but you can also do this with shoes. Try to tap the ground hard several times with the ball of your foot. Come on, do it. Stand up. Tap the ground several times hard with the ball of your feet. Now take note of how the shock is felt throughout your body. Where is the shock traveling? And you have to stand up to do it. You notice that the shock is being absorbed by the gastrocnemius muscles. They are your natural shock absorber and the shock tends to disperse more evenly throughout the body. Again, relative to individual. Now, try the same thing, but instead of tapping the ball of the foot hard against the ground, tap the heel of the foot hard against the ground. You don't have to do it a hundred times, just four or five times. Well, what do you feel? What you would feel is that the shock travels to two places, two areas. The shock would travel to your knee, and also to your spine, to your lower back especially. What does that mean? That means when you walk with a shoe that has an elevated heel, that you tend to constantly tap that heel into the ground because of the structure of the shoe. And that shock travels continuously to your knees and your lower back, which we all know is not healthy. Now, the shock might not be felt as strongly as in our experiment that we did just now, but the accumulated little shocks that you get throughout the day in weeks and months and years and decades, these would definitely have a toll on your health and well-being. And it's not just the, the knees and the lower back, because once the knees and the lower back uh, are hurt once they are compromised other bodily functions might be affected as well but I won't get into it right now the third problem that we have with modern sports shoes is that a lot of them have those shock observers now first of all let me tell you that this is almost like a marketing conspiracy that was created by Nike and Reebok and Adidas and all of these shoe companies back in uh, circa the 1970s, 1980s. They tried to reinvent the shoe and there isn't a lot that hasn't been done with shoes because we've had shoes for thousands of years. Uh, people would still usually and mostly walk barefoot all over the world until 200, 150, 100 years ago depending on where you look. but shoes were around and they were useful like i said we shouldn't rule shoes shoes out entirely and we have made so many different designs for thousands of years that the shoes were difficult to reinvent and 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 the market as being innovative but then they came up with this thing called the shock observers now these things are very useful for certain types of sports for instance if we look at basketball, 
humans, unlike lemurs, are not designed to jump around all the time. We do, just do not have the musculature, the, the tendon structure, and the bones to support us jumping all over the place all day long. It really, really hurts our bodies to do so repeatedly for a very long period of time. However, basketball requires that we jump a lot all the time. I mean, relative to running, we don't jump as much, but we do jump a lot. So what do we do? If we have those shock observers, that's great. That protects our bodies from this excessive jumping. Now, don't get me wrong. Humans can jump magnificently, right? We look at the high jumps or, or the long jumps at the Olympics, and, and humans can are capable of incredible jumping feats, but they're not built to sustain continuous jumping for dozens of minutes and hours on end. That's the difference. That's what I mean. Uh, they tend, not everyone, but they tend to get injuries and bodily problems when they jump too much. And this is when and why and how those shoes with the shock observers play a role. However, in the martial arts, we don't jump as much. We might, it might exist in a martial art, but it doesn't happen all the time. It's not, like, not, not nearly as much as in basketball. So what happens when we have those shock observers? We, we don't need them professionally for what we do. And what those shock observers tend to, to cause is um, a decline in the function of those gastrocnemius muscles that I was discussing earlier. So again, the gastrocnemius muscles are, is, are those um, round bulbs that you have at the back of the shins. And these are your natural shock absorbers. When they function correctly, they're supposed to do the type of work that the shock absorbers do on the sports shoes. But what our, our bodies, as you know, are very smart, innately, biologically so. And, and what happens is when our bodies feel that we receive enough of something, they tend to stop taking care of that something themselves. So I'll give you a few examples. Humans have lost the ability to produce vitamin C. They're one of just few mammals like guinea pigs that cannot produce vitamin C, which is why we need vitamin C from either foods or supplements. Now, one theory has it that humans, when they were evolving, had so much vitamin C going around. They're eating a lot of fruits and vegetables rich in vitamin C that our bodies gradually said, oh, you know what? There's so much vitamin C around. I don't need to produce it anymore. And we have lost the ability to produce vitamin C. Similar thing happens to bodybuilders when they use various steroids that the body is supposed to produce naturally um, and use testosterone, which are gonads are supposed to produce themselves. And what happens if the bodybuilders do not use these things very precisely uh, under a doctor's supervision and they really, really know what they do. And then over the years, um, if the abuse is very serious, could happen within months at times, the body could lose the ability partially or fully to produce testosterone. And what happens to such a bodybuilder, unfortunately, and I have nothing against bodybuilding, it's a beautiful sport, I really like it, and those bodybuilders end up with having to take testosterone supplements for the rest of their lives because their bodies just said, oh, you know what? Um, I'm getting enough of this, so I, I just don't need to produce it anymore. Or otherwise, if we look at the example of weight training, it's the same the other way around. If you were weight training for several years and you stop weight training for a year, what's going to happen? In a year, you're very likely to go back to how you looked almost like before you weight trained because the body says, I'm not using all that muscle. Why, why should they keep all that muscle mass? It's wasteful. All that muscle mass requires so much effort and so much energy. I'm going to get rid of it. So why did I give you this, uh, this whole bunch of information? The reason being that you are doing the same to your gastrocnemius muscles when you wear shoes with shock absorbers because the action of the shock absorption is one of the main 
functions and utilities of the gastrocnemius muscles. And when you take it away from them, when you give that function to the shock absorbers in the shoe, then the gastrocnemius muscles in the body feel, ah, you know, we don't need to work as hard anymore. And you get less strength, less, less pliability, less shock absorption, and less, less flexibility in those gastrocnemius muscles of yours. So you could train them separately, of course. You could otherwise then uh, go and skip rope barefoot or, or go and uh, work the gastrocnemius muscles uh, in, in the gym and whatever. But it's not going to be the same because the amount of exposure that you get from walking or running or training for many, many hours, the, the, just the amount of effort the gastrocnemius muscles are supposed to get, you can't replicate otherwise, but they're not getting enough of it because you have those shock absorbers on the sports shoes. So all of these issues make those sports shoes problematic. And now another aspect of it, which I'd like to touch upon, which is also very important, is that if you look at most types of sports shoes, and actually most shoes in general nowadays, you'd see that the toe area of the shoes is somewhat curled back. Well, it, this, this is meant to, to help the shoe roll with the step, uh, almost like, like a, um, a quarter, uh, quarter circle structure, so or, or like a boat structure. So when you step, you can roll the step because the sole is not flat. So but when the sole is flat, it requires a little bit of effort to roll the step. But if the sole is slightly curved, the step rolls more easily. But if you think about it, that's not a good thing for us health-wise, and it's a very bad thing for us martial artists. And I'll explain why. So if you have the tip of the shoe slightly rolled up and back, it means that your toes, when inside the shoe, are also slightly elevated at all times. And what do we know as martial artists? We want to keep our rooting, we want to keep our stability, and when our toes are held up, what do we lose? Our rooting and stability. That's so easy to do. Just stand in front of a wall, push the wall. Okay, just stand barefoot. You must be barefoot for this one, push the wall, okay? Now try to push the wall while lifting up your toes on both feet or even just one foot by one centimeter or half an inch. What happens? It's much more difficult to push the wall, right? Because you, lo you lose part of your rooting and stability. Now imagine as a martial artist that you would mistakenly would be wearing a device that actually causes you to be slightly uprooted and imbalanced by the virtue of just wearing that thing, making it much easier for your opponents to work with you and also making you not uh, have the best type of practice that you could have because essentially you are misaligned with your entire structure and with your skeleton and in the manner in which your musculature operates by the virtue of the structure of the shoe. Now I call this phenomenon toes that cast a shadow. If you look at such a, a shoe when you wear it and there is sunshine, you'd see that there is a big shadow under the toes because the toes, are, the, the front of the foot is slightly lifted. Uh, so that's a big problem. And we have to think about all of these issues with all manner of shoes that we would like to choose and I'll get to the best types of shoes soon because they affect our practice significantly and can also dramatically affect our health in a matter of years and decades of wearing shoes of certain types. Um, maybe the last issue I would like to tackle here, and, and there are many more, but uh, we, we can't have that lecture last for hours, is the issue of toe space. So naturally humans are supposed to have 
what's called splayed toes. Splay, the toes are supposed to be able to spread out as similarly to how you could spread out your fingers, uh, the fingers of your palm. But unfortunately, for the most of us, we are only able to spread out the toes just a little. I can spread them more than other people because I've walked barefoot for several years. And this is unhealthy for us. This is basically hindering our overall flexibility relative to our potential. It changes our musculature. It changes the way our skeleton operates. It changes even the function of our internal organs it has to do with theories in Chinese medicine that I won't get into now. But basically, you would like for both for your uh, martial arts function and your overall health, it's best for you if you could splay your toes as wide as possible. Just in terms of common sense functionality, you know, if you want greater stability, the wider you can open those toes, the better grip they have off the ground. Now, the issue is, as you know, with most types of shoes, they are narrow at the edge and at the, at the, at the point. So your toes kind of crowd together, which is what is causing the lack of toe flexibility in most people and can also cause bunions, which is um, a deformity of the bone, usually the bone that connects to the big toe uh, this, that can be unsightly and also can turn very painful. And this is usually caused by the wearing of shoes from a young age. It happens to a certain percentage of the population. I've even seen a very serious martial arts practitioners and teachers that have bunions and they shouldn't have, they, sh they really shouldn't have, but it comes from wearing the wrong types of shoes. So what kinds of shoes are best? Uh, we would like to have a shoe that's f first of all, that does not have an elevated heel uh, for the reasons I have explained no elevated heel. Second of all, um, comes with it. We want a flat sole as flat as possible. That's closest to how we would walk barefoot, uh, enabling the parts of our foot that are supposed to touch the ground feel inside the shoe as if they are on a flat surface. And I would also like to have a shoe that's breathable because when we don't have a breathable shoe, then we have moisture and moisture uh, introduces fungus and nearly 100% of people that have fungal infections on their toenails and on their feet have those infections because of excess of moisture. When your foot is dry, you cannot have toe fungus, especially when it's exposed to direct sunlight. I can tell you all those years that I've walked barefoot, I've never had issues with fungus. Okay, I've had other issues, I'll get to that, but not with fungi. Now, we also would like potentially, if it's possible, it's more difficult to find a shoe that has what's called a large wide toe box that would allow our toes to gradually open up. And that's not gonna happen overnight or even over a few weeks for your toes to regain their flexibility and really be able to splay out more like they were supposed to, uh, expect that to take a few years. All right, uh, I have toes that can splay out significantly and they still are not at the same level as those feet that they see coming out of the Amazon rainforest. They are close, but they're not there and certainly not as thick. Now, um, we, I, I spoke about the shock absorbers. We also don't want a shoe that grips your, your foot too hard. Okay, it's good for the shoe to have a decent grip so it wouldn't be too loose, but we don't want a shoe that is like a cast on your foot because that actually makes you more prone to injury because when you lose your footing, you cannot improvise with delicate motions with your feet and get out of that predicament and then you more easily sprain the foot. Now, I think I don't have to tell you that flip-flops are not the best choice for anything, especially not martial arts uh, for common sense reasons, so I won't even get to that. So, 
And the shoes we were aiming for are what are called barefoot shoes, of which there are many brands nowadays, fortunately. It wasn't the same situation 15 years ago. Barefoot shoes, and, and please take note that not all shoes called barefoot shoes are really authentic, are shoes that have all or most of those characteristics that I have described, and they also have a thin sole. So potentially we would like to have the thinnest sole possible because this brings us closest to walking barefoot, which is the natural manner in which our bodies ought to function. And you'd be surprised that a sole as thin as two to three millimeters is insulating enough even for snow. It's true, folks. And you have to realize that those shock absorbers are not only uh, those pockets filled with air. Essentially, thick soles, even if they don't have the so-called shock absorbers, also function as shock absorbers and they hurt the function flexibility of the gastrocnemius muscles. So you want as thin a sole as possible because then it would force your feet to strengthen themselves and also your gastrocnemius to function correctly. Now barefoot shoes come in all different shapes, sizes and designs. I like to train with the Vibram Five Fingers. Uh, the only problem with these shoes is that for martial arts training they might not be as durable as you would hope. Uh, they might last you anywhere between three and nine months if you practice every day uh, on in the outside. Okay, if you practice inside a martial arts school or in a home or a hall, then the Vibram Five Fingers might last you much longer. If you train outside, they're likely to not last a year. They're gonna have uh, small rips and holes develop in them, unfortunately. But these are very good shoes. Um, they're, they, it makes them expensive, not because they're very expensive, but because you have to replace them every once in a while. And you also have uh, Vivo Barefoot, that's a very good company and they make shoes that look like dress shoes but there are also at the same time what's called minimalist or barefoot shoes and most of their shoes would have those criteria that are positive for martial arts training and health that I've mentioned. Uh, there are other brands, uh, there's Softstar, there is Merrill, uh, there, is, there are even snow boots called Kuva boots. K I think it's K-U-U-V-A, something like that. Uh, there are a lot of them. There's a website called birthdayshoes.com, birthdayshoes.com that has reviews for uh, a few dozen types of shoes and brands, uh, most of them barefoot shoes that you can look into. And you can research this and find uh, what would be your shoe of preference. I mean, that the shoes are like clothing, right? We, we all prefer something slightly different that's all right as long as they're healthy and functional that's great now the best types of shoes you could potentially possibly wear are your own feet walking and training barefoot is just the best thing you could do for your body your mind for just overall health it's great they have issues they have many issues um first of all and, and you know what it's not what you would expect so people would, would often tell me, oh, you walk barefoot, you're going to step on glass. Well, you know what? I step on glass many a time and you don't get cut. Surprisingly so, what happens is typically when you start feeling that sharpness, your foot changes its alignment and then glass is not going to penetrate. For many, many years that I've walked barefoot on the streets, never had issues with glass. What I did have issues with are other things. So... First of all, it's going to take time for your skin to get accustomed to it, so your skin's going to rip a lot. And then you have to take a pumice stone and take care of your skin and do a lot of bathing, and uh, that's a bummer. Uh, another issue is the cold. So I used to live in Israel. In Israel, you could really walk barefoot all year long. If you had enough warm clothes in the winter, uh, that would work out, especially central Israel. However, nowadays I live in Toronto, where it's no longer possible, unfortunately. That's a cold place, Toronto. And when you walk barefoot, that cold really gets into your body because we absorb temperature for our feet and especially for the acupuncture point called 
Yongquan. Yongquan is uh, at the base of the ball of the foot. And this is the first point on the kidney meridian. Absorbing cold for that point can affect your kidneys and cause all sorts of health issues. And this is why we ought to walk barefoot from the day we're born. Trying to get accustomed to it as an adult, uh, it's challenging. And not, uh, mo- not a lot of people, I would say even uh, not most people are not up to it. And it, it's a process that's going to take anyone who tries it at least several years. And another issue I had to contend with was scabies. Uh, these tiny parasites, they're almost microscopic. Some people can see them with the naked eye. They're really, really tiny and they go under your skin. They make a tent under your skin and you can't get those bastards out. They're very difficult to get out and they're far, far, far more itchy than, than lice and, and mosquito bites. They're just terrible. You want to cut your foot off. And I got the, the scabies like four different times. And unfortunately, eventually, I found there are two types of um, medications that you could easily uh, use against scabies and make them disappear in 24 hours. I'll give you their names. Uh, that's first of all, Ichtamol paste. Uh, that's spelled, I think, that would be I C H T H A M M O L. Ichtamol. Uh, I'm not sure how it ought to be spelled, all these strange names they give medicines nowadays. Uh, that's just a paste you put where you got the, the scabies bites or what scabies made your skin into their tents and they tend to go away within 24 to 48 hours and there's also uh, a type of medicine called ivermectin which is anti-parasitic medicine and in some countries it's over the counter it's spelled i-v-e-r-m-e-c-t-i-n ivermectin also very useful you can uh, I think you can put on your skin you can take it orally and, and, th- and these things really save me because some people get stuck with scabies for years. That's terrible. So um, that wasn't the party. I mean, get, getting all those issues, but my life changed for the better walking barefoot and I still walk barefoot most of the time as much as possible. And it has made my feet so much stronger. You wouldn't believe I, at one point I realized when I was teaching my students ground grappling that they couldn't put uh, joint locks on my feet. Now it's not that it's impossible, but, but you have to be skilled at it. And the reason being that the musculature and the bones and the connective tissues in my feet became so strong from walking barefoot for many years that they were very difficult to manipulate into a joint lock. And I would just lay there and give my foot to, to a student to try to joint lock <laughs> and not even resist. And they, they would have a difficult time doing that. Um, not resisting at all, just because the feet became so strong. So, I mean, if, if you guys are into ground grappling, if you're doing MMA or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and you want to protect your, your feet from ankle locks and, and, and other types of joint, joint locks, some, some of them are illegal in, in BJJ and MMA, then by all means, try to walk more barefoot, not just in, I mean, in the gym, that doesn't really count because there's the soft mats. You have to walk or possibly train and run barefoot outside on, on hard ground and, and varied terrain. And over the years, that, that makes one's feet so very strong. I couldn't recommend it enough. It's also peace of mind, you know. I would not even realize that I have shoes I would wake up in the morning, I would be barefoot, I would walk out, I'd be barefoot. It would be very natural, very easy. And life just changes for the better. Not to mention that so much money that I saved on shoes during those years and even today because I walk barefoot a lot. Uh, because you don't walk as much with shoes, so you don't have to replace them as often, right? So um, this was a short survey uh, about shoes and the martial arts. And I, I would tell you if possible again as much as you can try to train barefoot if not with barefoot shoes in my opinion that's the best option you got though there are some exceptions of course there's some martial arts that were designed from their origin to be practiced while wearing shoes western boxing is a very good example right 
in Western boxing, you have to wear shoes while at well at least while you fight professionally in the ring not all boxing gyms enforce this in training um but since you have to wear shoes when you compete you have to get accustomed to them also fortunately there are so many brands and designs to choose from that optimally if you practice western boxing you can find a good compromise between all of these different traits that i've named earlier and find a shoe that's good for western boxing but also good for your body and your training now there are also other martial arts uh, like ba ji chuen a traditional chinese martial art the name is spelled b-a-j-i b-a-j-i space q-u-a-n q-u-a-n ba ji chuen i know it it looks like quan but uh, in chinese transcript you read it chuen and this martial art was designed from the onset uh, practiced and, and cultivated by people who wore shoes. So it includes various methods for sliding your feet across the surface and even types of stomping that benefit the use of shoes. And this martial art can be said to almost be impossible to practice without shoes. Likewise, a martial art which I have studied, practiced and I teach, Xing Yi Quan, traditional Chinese martial art. It's spelled X-I-N-G space Y-I space Q-U-A-N Xin Yi Quan This martial art is not impossible to practice barefoot but barefoot practice is more difficult and takes time to get accustomed to and of course that makes a whole lot of sense because again we humans have been wearing shoes for a very long time we had shoes for thousands of years uh, they became more prominent over the past uh, 100 to 200 years depending on where you live and people who have developed martial arts uh, were attuned to the stuff they were wearing it makes a whole lot of sense anyhow if you enjoyed this lecture please share the link with friends fellow students teachers relatives whomever you see fit hit that subscribe button just hit it because i am going to have many more lectures coming as well as incredible fantastic super interesting interviews on the jadecast podcast on this youtube channel if you would like to learn more about what i do and about our organization blue jade martial arts international you're welcome to look at bluejadesociety.com that's blue like the color blue jade like the gemstone jade society like a society bluejadesociety.com and you can find my books on any amazon affiliated website just go on your favorite amazon website and type in the search bar names like research of martial arts or the martial arts teacher or just write my name down jonathan bluestein and if you'd like to discuss more about shoes for the martial arts you're welcome to do so in the comments you may even contact me directly i don't mind my email is jonathan.bluestein at gmail.com or you can look me up on facebook at jonathan bluestein fortunately there's only one on the entire facebook that somehow happened anyhow i catch you another time wishing you the best and keep on the good training